Council regarding Portuguese immigration to rural Massachusetts. Gladys, can you remember um, the date of birth of your mother and father? My mother was May the 25th. I can't remember the year. My father, I can't remember. How old do you think they would be today, roughly? Because we don't go back and get that information later. Um, I couldn't tell you. Well, tell me your date of birth. My date of birth is July the 17th, 1918. I'm 80 years old. Now, um, where were your parents born? My parents were born in Graciosa, Azores, in the island. In Portugal? In Portugal, that's right. Oh. Um, and do you remember um, the lifestyle that your mother, for instance, lived when she was in the Azores? They lived, uh, my grandfather was a farmer, and uh, she came here to better herself, you know. And she came to an aunt and uncle that had previously come, a couple that had come, and they rent a big house. And my mother came to live with this particular aunt. Now, um, how old was your mother when she left the age of? My mother was going to be 12. She was 11, almost 12 years old. Because in those days, you could go and work in the mills when you were 13 and 14. So. And how many brothers and sisters did she have? My mother had uh, three sisters, including herself, and two brothers. So three girls and two boys. Um, was it difficult for your grandmother to let her come so far away? Uh, yes, in those days, uh, the elderly people did this because they wanted a better life for their children. And this is why my mother came. My mother came and worked in the mills during the day and went to school at night. Grammar, uh, you mean uh, regular public school? Public school, that's right, to learn to read and write and so forth. Did she come on a boat? I believe so, yes. And did she come by herself? I think there were other girls that came with her. I couldn't remember who, but there were other girls that came with her. A lot of the mothers would let their daughters come because they were coming to relatives' homes so that they could better themselves. Now, it sounds as if when they got to be a particular age that they they gathered together as a group and decided this was going to be the, the place to go this was a better life it, that's right and so did anyone um approach them solicit them uh as mill workers in portugal did you ever find out i don't know but just yes. by word of mouth no they believe so so your mom left when she was 11, how about your father? I couldn't tell you how old, how old my father was because my father came, he was older, I'm, I'm sure, and he came, he came with his mother and the whole family. His father too? Yes, they all came together. Oh, well that, and, and what did the father do as an occupation before he left? I, you mean my father? My father? No, no, your grandfather. Oh, I couldn't tell you that. My grandmother, I never knew, I never knew my grandfather, but I did know my grandmother, and I never knew her to work. She stayed at home, and all the children worked. My father and all of the children worked. Did they also uh, take a voyage on a boat? I believe so, because that was the only way they came in those days, was by boat. How many siblings did your father have? My father had one, two, uh, two boys, and my aunt boys, Hazel, Mary, and four girls, four girls and two boys. And um, did they come from, from the Azores as well? They did. Mm -hmm. When they arrived here, were they living with relatives? I couldn't tell you that either. I can't remember. Um, was the intent of both of your parents then to come and work in the mills? I believe so, because that was the only job they were for people that came from foreign countries. That was the only type of work they had. My father worked in the mill, but not too long, because my father was a shoemaker, and he repaired shoes, because in those days everybody had their shoes repaired. Today you don't. You know, you take your shoes and throw them out, but in those days 
you always had heels and soles put on your shoes. So he was a shoemaker, and he opened up his own little store, uh, own little business in the back of a store. In the front of the store, he had a grocery store. He had fruit and meats and so forth. And in the back, at night, he would repair shoes. What was the name of his store? John Sousa's Market. And where was that located? That was located at the corner of uh, his first store when I was just a tot was right on Elm Street. But the second store, when they moved across the street, it was at the corner of Elm and Chapel. I've heard a lot of people already talking about yeah. your father's store. Was it fun to have a father that owned a, a yes, store? Yes, it, it was because um, when I was uh, just starting in grammar school, he had a candy bar. They had penny candies and so forth. And I'd go in, because he'd like to make friends at school, and I'd go in and s steal candy. From, he knew I was taking it, but I thought I was stealing it. Steal candy to give all my friends at school. Um, do you know how long your parents were here before they met and married? I couldn't tell you that either. And do you know um, if this marriage was arranged, or did they just... No, it wasn't arranged, no. They never knew each other in Europe, wherever they came from, from Graciosa, because Graciosa is a small island, but the villages are so far from one another, and the only way they have transportation is walk. Today, it's entirely different, but in those days, they had to walk. There was no such a thing as God. For the most part, though, um, I assume they lived in a Portuguese community. Yes. My Uncle Manuel owned all the property on Elm Street. He owned... Uh, 44, number 44, which is a four-decker uh, house. He owned 48, which was another four-decker house. He owned the other one, which was, I mean, I think 1552. He owned most of the property on Elm Street. He bought it, I think, from a man called Mr. Flood. I'm not sure. I can only, uh, you know, repeat uh, things that I heard as a child. And my uncle, uh, it was like a, a family commune, you know. He lived on the first floor. We lived on the second floor. My uh, godmother lived on the third floor. My grandmother lived on the fourth floor. It was all family that lived in the area. Family and very dear friends. And on the other side, we had Mrs. Augusta. We had um, Mrs. Mindy was another family. I can't remember some of them. And it was just, and then at night, we would uh, sit around because there was no radio. There was nothing in those days. Everybody thinks America was always the way it is today, and it wasn't. It's an entirely different thing. And there was hardship. We were fortunate because my father had the store, and we always got along pretty comfortable because uh, he worked all day long in the store, and at night he repaired shoes. Yeah, he stayed in the store to repair them, or he brought that work? No, home? no, it was right in the store, in the back of the store. It was like this particular house here. This would be the front of the the store, the market, and then on the other side would be the uh, shoe shop, the repair shop. So the shop was not... Um, it was all like in one big Within floor. the house? It was within the house. It's right in the house. In the house you lived in? No, no, no. I, I lived on Elm Street with my uncle on the three-decker house, and the cobble shop was across the street. I see. So if you wanted to see Dad, even though he was at work, you could run over Oh, yes, there. right across the street. Mm -hmm. So it was a big community. Yeah, that's, that's... How many uh, children in your family? In my family, there were three girls and one boy. And what, and what position do you hold? Such as? In, in what is your birth order? I'm the oldest. You're, you're no, no, I'm the oldest girl. My brother was the oldest oh, boy. He was right. the first child, and then I was the second. My sister was the third, and then we had a baby sister, Peggy. She's in Um, I wonder if, if you remember your mother talking about um, her experiences when she first came to America, whether she was disappointed or pleasantly um, surprised. No, I think that they were, um, naturally, she must have been homesick. I'm sure she must have been homesick. But um, they came to help their parents. That was the intent. Years ago, children 
help their parents. You worked and you saved money so that you could send it back home and make a better life for your parents back home. And I think that my grandmother evidently thought that they would all go back home when they had plenty of money and all lived happily ever after, but that doesn't exist. Once you come, anybody, once they come to America, they don't want to go back. So that, that was my next question. Was the intent to return I to think the Azores? Most, I think most all of them, you know, they must have thought that they would someday go back. My mother was a very good daughter. She went back many times. Every time my grandmother was sick, she would go back and take care of us. I can remember one time when we were little, my sister must have been two when I was four or something like that. I was very little. I can remember them saying that they went back. She went back because my grandmother was sick to take care of my grandmother. And who took care of you? We all went with my mother. Uh huh. Uh huh. My mother wouldn't leave her children. So you went. You went to the Azores many times. Yes, I have. Yes. Oh, and what are your memories of that? Uh, well, it was a, what was it like at it, Grandma's house? It was a different place entirely. I can't remember the first time because, as I said, I was small. And the second time I went, I was a little older. And uh, it's still hard and difficult for me to remember too much, although I know that my grandmother just was thrilled to death. And I think that uh, her illness was because she was homesick for her children and her grandchildren. I really think that was the biggest when you when you went to visit, I'm wondering why she didn't return with you. Oh, my grandmother wouldn't leave home. I mean, that's where she was born and brought up, and mm -hmm. you know, she just didn't want to leave the house. Naturally, the daughters were all here, and and evidently my mother, you know, she knew that my mother eventually would marry, and each one, you know, tends their own life and so forth. So. Do you remember how how old your grandparents were when they passed on? My grandmother, I'm trying to think who died first. One of them was 90 and the other, I believe, was 92. Something like that. I think my, my grandfather died last. He was 92. Yeah. You so have I, a long list so of family yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm and headed in the same direction. Is, what do you eat? <laughs> <laughs> We're taking a what do you eat <laughs> uh, survey. Um, what do you remember eating as a child? What were your meals? Uh, a lot of uh, greens, you know, soups and so forth. But uh, years ago, if I can remember distinctly, uh, down in the flats, naturally there were no pieces of land that you could cultivate, but they always uh, rented a piece of land somewhere that they could grow potatoes and greens and so forth. But we didn't do much of that because my father had the store. And so he, everything came from the store practice. Oh, so but, uh, a, a, but lot a lot of, of the folks around were farming in Yeah, They would rent pieces of land that they could raise their vegetables and then they would preserve all of their vegetables mm -hmm. and can them, Not n no such a thing as canning that was in the glass jars and put the rubber around them and so forth and preserve them so that in the summertime they would grow the vegetables so that they would have that for the winter. Now did your father buy any of that produce, canned produce from your neighbors? No, no he didn't. As I, I can remember all, everything came from the wholesalers. Mm -hmm. um, but you remember primarily eating soup, which soup was made out of what? A meat stock. And uh, they would kill their own, uh, slaughter their own pigs once a year and to preserve that so that they would have for the winter time. Mostly you ate pork then? Pork. Portuguese people eat a lot of pork. At which, they, which they themselves make into sausages? We make sausages and bacon. Um, What do you remember about, you were born here, so what do you remember about being in school? And what school did you attend? I went to the Butler School. First of all, I went to the Central Street School, which is the school that I now am the receptionist, okay? That was my first school, the Central Street School. Then I went to the Edson, which is across the street from McDonough's Funeral Home. It used to be the Edson School. And then from there I went to the Butler School, which is, I think it's closed now, 
It's on Warren Street. And then from there, I went to high school. And then I left high school before I was through so that I could go to Boston to the Wilfred Academy in Boston. To learn what? Hairdressing. You're a hairdresser? Yeah. I was for 30 years. Oh, did you own your own shop? I did for 30 years. And where was that located? Downtown. Mm -hmm. In the Bradley building. I was in the Bradley building for 25 years. And then when um, Dunham built that new building on, on George Street, that brand new 21 George Street, I moved over there and I was there for five years. And then one day I just got tired and gave it all up. Um, and I gave it up so that I could stay home and bring up my grandchildren. Uh, Gladys, did your mother ever work? Uh, to my knowledge, my mother did never work too much. My mother stayed at home because my father made enough for my mother to stay home and take care of us. And did your mom um, fill the position of babysitter for any of her relatives? No, no, my mother never did. So none of your cousins were uh -uh. around? In those days, there weren't too many babysitters. If there were babysitters, it would be grandmother that would be a babysitter, the outside babysitters. There weren't too many people that babysat. It would be always grandma, such as my grandmother brought up my cousins, which was Mary Emanuel, and Mary and John, uh, because she was at home with them. Um, do you recall many of the parents, the mothers and fathers of your friends working? No, I don't. No. Most of your friends, mothers were at home? I think some of them worked. My mother. If I can recall, my mother later on in life did work for the um, Suffolk Knitting Company, but that was after we were all grown up. Mm -hmm. Suffolk Knitting on, uh, what is it, at Appleton Street. Mm -hmm. Where was McGowan Educator Cracker? Oh, that was over on Market Street. Market Street. Yeah, my mother worked there. Did your parents um, retain their accent? My mother didn't, no, no. My mother lost her accent because she came when she was young. Mm -hmm. But um, my mother spoke very good English. And how about your father? My father did too because he, in the store, you know, naturally, he picked up quite a bit. Um, do you remember any um, problems related to other ethnic communities? No, I, I can honestly say that years ago, that never existed because when we lived on Elm Street, we had Italians, we had Lithuanians, we had uh, we had um, Polish people, we had Portuguese people. We lived right next door, which was the Welsh block, which was all Irish, and we all, I mean, everyone got along so well with one another. I never knew what it was like to hear people fight the same as you hear now. You know this gang-related, all of this stuff that you hear today. Uh, uh, they can't get along with the Hispanics. We all lived with one another, and it was a, I'm telling you, growing up, we had a wonderful uh, feeling uh, when, with all of the other nationalities. We had no problem at all. But. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, and, and, and what was family life like in your house? What was it? Uh, what would a day hold in terms of? Well, as I said, uh, we went to school naturally, and then my mother was home. And well, when I went to school, describe what it was like at school. When it was like at school is because when we went to school, we had uh, we came home. We went to school at eight o'clock. We came home at eleven thirty. My mother was home and gave us our lunch. And then we went back at 1 o'clock again, and we stayed till 4. It's not like today, you know. Today, they only have one session. We had double session. There was no such a thing as busing. We walked to school four times a day. Mm -hmm. and regardless of the weather? Whether, whether the sun, in the wintertime, in my day, the snow would be almost up to your, your, over your knees. But we walked, and there was no such a thing as no school. And you're not exaggerating. You that, no, know, I know that was no. true. The snow did get very good. good. And we loved it because, because I think it was because they didn't have the equipment that we have today. And uh, the snow would pile up so high that you couldn't see the people that were across the street. 
and we loved it because we'd walk on the snow banks and then when we get home wet my mother would scold us and we'd get probably a smash in the the rump because we were soft and wet <laughs> but today what did you not wear out in the listen. snow to play what did you have what was your snow gear oh god we didn't have snow gear like they have today we were soft and wet when we came in and changed no, all we can have was long stockings, that's all, and... No leggings. No leggings. There was no such a thing as leggings. That came after. So if you wanted to play in the snow, you had to wear your dress out with that's your right. long stockings. The long coat, you know, your coat. Any particular boots? Yeah, we did have boots. Yeah, we did have boots. That was it. Um, and discipline in your house, how was it? Oh, well, my mother was... All my mother had to do was look at us, and we didn't know where to turn. But my father was the salt of the earth. He was the same story. He was a, he this is the same story. I, I think we have some so, he was a Portuguese men are all gentle and Portuguese man. mothers are all. My, and, and he'd scold my mother lots of times. I'd say, well, she didn't do anything. What are you scolding her for, you know? Because he didn't believe. I don't ever, ever remember my father lifting a hand to us. Ever, ever. But my mother. All she had to do was look at us, and we we scat, believe me. <laughs> what things made her angry? Oh, if she wasn't feeling good, everything made her angry. I don't know. <laughs> she was a good person, but, you know, she... Mm. Yeah. Um, so, where do you then think you developed the, the respectful behavior that is so important to you? Was that understood in your house? And if so, how did you understand it? Well, the only thing is when my mother said, don't do it, you just didn't do it. And she said, do it, and you did it, you know? And sit, you sat. It's not like the children today. You have to talk to them a half a dozen times. My mother spoke once, that was it. But why is that, do you think? Well, it's because uh, I think uh, it's a tone of voice, I think, sometimes that they use, and it's stern. And you know, she meant business. She wasn't fooling around. And I think this is what's lacking in, in the society today. The alternative, what was your alternative? I mean, obviously you learned that mom means business at a small age. That's right. And, you're, and what was the alternative to being naughty? Well, we'd get a, a spanker. We'd got a spanker. Okay. Um, and, and so your brother being the oldest of the four, um, what relationship did he have with your father? Well, we all had the same relationship with my father. As I said, my father was a saint. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. And uh, he didn't have to talk to us because my, my mother did all the talking and all the discipline. And she was at home. He was over to the store and he was trying to make a living for us. So naturally, he, what she said went, you know. we Did he back her up? Oh, yeah, he wouldn't say that. <laughs> if she smashed us, I mean, you know, scolded us or anything like that, he wouldn't say a word. Because she, you know, he figured she knew what she was doing. And we had to pay attention to what she said. Now, I guess my um, a, a question that I have about that is that apparently you must not have felt any hostility from that punishment because of course not. you were not angry at your mother. Uh -uh. You didn't say, I'm going to teach you. No, no, never. And do you think that that was a general feeling in the community? The I parents? think so, yes. I think all of us. Even when I went to my uncle's house downstairs, because he was a landlord, and we went downstairs, and uh, we weren't allowed to mess up the apartments. If we dropped anything, we had to pick it up and sweep, you know. We had to do all of that. But um, uh, even when my uncle spoke, well, we paid attention. In, his ca in, her, in my aunt's case, it was my uncle that we were afraid of, not my aunt. And in my house, it was my mother. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about any particular young person in the neighborhood that you would consider naughty? What, what was naughty behavior that yeah, extended I, beyond the household? I don't, I, I don't think that we had uh, any problem with any other children in the neighborhood like they have today. Really, I don't. Maybe it's the vitamins that they take that's them up too much. <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. Um, what What was the entertainment in your life? The entertainment in our life was that 
on Saturday night, we will go down to the Portuguese Band Hall. That today is considered the center down on Charles Street, and there were folk dancers down there. A lot of the old men played guitars, and it was typical Portuguese dancing. You know, that was the entertainment. The whole family. The whole family would come on Saturday night. And um, and at a certain age, did anyone feel uh, that they didn't want to go anymore? You just didn't Young go. people. You just didn't go. You went. Your mother said, "You go, you go." And at what point were you released from that obligation, or didn't you ever want to be? No, I, I, we enjoyed it. And even today, I go to all of these functions, the dances and so forth. You create it. That's what <laughs> um, Is that where most young couples met? Years ago, at yes. At those functions? And at church, and, and church dances. Years ago, the church would always hold dances at the, on Dutton Street, which used to be the Knights of Columbus. It is today the, where they go in to sign us the heat and so forth, right there at the lights near the, near the right place there, next door. There's a diner there at the corner. Mm -hmm. That's Dutton Street there. Merrimack Rug. That's right. Right next to the Merrimack Rug. That building there was a beautiful dance hall. They used to call it the Knights of Columbus. We had dances, church dances there. It was lovely. We had the church dances, and we had one which would be the apron and tie dance. And then we had another what one. Was that? The apron and tie. The girls would wear, make it uh, uh, an apron, and then they'd have a tie. Uh, they'd make a tie for the boys, and they would wrap the tie up. And as you come in, you put the the York package in this basket that they had there. And uh, uh, then, because, you know, we wanted to be sure our boyfriends would say, you know, the package that has this, this, and this is my tie. If we didn't want the goop dancing with us, <laughs> we wanted to make sure that it'd be our boyfriend. Ever. And then we had the uh, basket dance. And what else? Oh, we had so many What's dances. the basket dance? And we'd make a, a lunch. It was like a lunch. We'd make a, a, a lunch. And then we'd say, well, my basket has this, this, and this, you know, and it had a certain ribbon on it to make sure that your boyfriend got that, and that, that and he would be your partner for there that. There were no mistakes. No. <laughs> but there were many. <laughs> That's oh, and then we I had the like hat. And then we had a hat dance, a fancy hat dance, and then we had um, prizes given for the, the, the most co comedy, the most comical hat, and the most beautiful hat, you know. You'd make a hat, and, of course, you'd put it on when they had this, particular march like they have for New Year's, you know, they'd have the grand march and you'd march around and then we'd have judges picking oh tell you. We used to have a lot of fun. There was a lot of things that I can't remember some of them. It eventually will come to me. Maybe it would be nice if you if you did a school circuit of lectures on how to have fun without getting drunk. I know it yeah, that's the truth. Because it was fun, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. Today um, do you recall the way that people became attracted to each other? Were there certain qualities that you looked for? Um, um, because I don't think it took as long. In other words, when you were a certain age, did you just most of the time find a person that you cared about and that was the person you Yeah, I think that you either met them at the dances. I met my husband at my father's store. He used to go there every afternoon before he went to work and then I met him there at the store and uh, and they started to talk to you and you know in those days you didn't go anywhere you had to if he wanted to speak to you he had to come to the door and speak to you over the fence you know my day <laughs> today it's about a and, and did he have to ask your father to give you a date that's right he had to ask my father for permission for a date mm -hmm. and, and what was the date Oh, it, and then, of course, if I went on the date, I had to take my sister. I couldn't go on a date alone. I had to have a chaperone. So a date would Did be probably just Did you slip her a quarter to look the other way? <laughs> we, have to, <laughs> we have to go either to the ice cream stand that used to be next to the Commodore. And you people don't remember that. There was an ice cream stand up there just for a walk up through the South Common. Today you can't walk through that area at all. And get some ice cream and back again. That's all. Maybe to a movie, but very seldom to a movie. 
What would have been considered a scandal when you were young? Yeah, uh, probably I was driving around in a topless uh, convertible or something like that. Yeah. I don't really know. So people didn't make too many moral mistakes yeah. in those days because the price would have been much too high. Yeah. That's the truth. Uh, wow. <coughs> Um, no, it's, it's not. You're not finished. I just want to, I just want to wonder, um, I remember when I first met you, you were suggesting to me that education was very important in this community, education of one kind or another, meaning that people needed to do something that would increase the value of their life. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that for me? Such as, um, what did you mean by increasing the life? Because naturally our parents wanted us to go to school, and my mother bought us a piano, and, and, and uh, my brother had a violin to make sure that we all learned something, you know what I mean? And um, uh, the most important was is to go to school and learn to educate yourself so that your life would be better. You wouldn't have to end up in the mill such as they had to, you know? But, um, did they, um, did you think that that was a fairly well-received suggestion? I mean, was it something that parents just expected? There must have been some young people who just didn't want to bother. Um, I don't remember anybody not wanting to go to school in my day. I mean, everybody tried. I think because their parents had struggled so much that they wanted to better themselves, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I know that uh, in growing up, uh, uh, we were very comfortable compared to other people, because my father did well. And um, but my, I can always remember that uh, uh, my mother always said, "You've got to better yourself. You've got to do um, your homework and make sure you study and so forth too." make sure that uh, you wouldn't have to work as hard as she did because I can remember my mother, uh, they had no luxuries in those days, uh, the same as we have today, and uh, so therefore she wanted us to be sure that uh, we had a better life than she had. Your music lessons, how did you get them? Um, the fellow that taught me, the first man that taught me piano was Mr. Gilmore. He lived on Walnut Street. And then after he, he, I took lessons from Raymond Kelly, which was the organist at St. Peter's Church. He gave private lessons, and I took lessons from him, because I never learned much. You <laughs> did I liked piano, but I liked fooling around, you know, playing crazy things on piano, not learning me. That's so, do you play the piano now? No, never. You never learned to play? Oh, I learned to play, but I forgot. Oh, God. I have all the music and all, but I forgot. In fact, I had a piano after not too many years ago. I bought a piano because I thought it'd be good for the arthritis fingers, you know, to get at it again. And I couldn't because the fingers would get blocked in between the uh, the black notes and the others. And I said I was killing myself. I just forget that. <laughs> So I took a brand new piano and I gave it to my granddaughter. I said, take it. I don't want it. And the violin lessons, who took those? My brother. Did he do well? Mm, not too well. He only took it to satisfy my parents because so they wanted us to be musicians. Music wasn't your calling. <laughs> you like to listen, but you don't like to do it. <laughs> and so um, did any of your siblings have a college education? Yes. You, you were a hairdresser and what were they? My, um, brother went in the service and my sister when she graduated from school. Oh, excuse me, Gladys. Music lessons and nobody really did very well. But, uh, we're musicians. But what were you, the education? When no, I went to work. Uh, I chose the Wilfrid. I graduated from Wilfrid in Boston. My sister went to work uh, in the service. She was a nurse in the army. And my brother 
was um, in the service too. How did your father feel about your sister entering the armed forces? Um, the reason my sister went in the armed forces is because my brother was a, a prisoner of war and uh, she decided that she was going to go into the service too. But then when it came time for her to, she signed for overseas and they wouldn't let her go overseas because where he was a prisoner, they wouldn't take her overseas because they didn't want two people, you know. Mm -hmm. And he was a he was a career military person. No, it was the Second World War. But did he stay in the military no, in no. his career? No, he did. He what came he out, and he was sick when he came out because he was then he uh, he was rescued by the Russians, and uh, he was uh, captive for a year. And then they brought him home and they took him to Lake Placid. Isn't that where they take him when they came in from? Europe, and he was out in the hospital there for a long time, but then my brother was never aware well after he came out of the service. So. Um, I'm going to ask you now about the uh, the marriages in your, in your family. When you became engaged, what kind of a wedding did you do? Very quiet. I just, I didn't get married here. I got married in California. We won't go into that area. And you and I was just wondering what kind of celebration you folks made about um, the wedding in your families. Were they were they quiet weddings? Uh, not too not too busy. Uh, they were kind of quiet. The one that was the biggest was my younger sister uh -huh. and my brother. My brother had a nice wedding. He was married in Lawrence. Still, by the name is here. But my uh, younger sister had a, a big wedding. But the rest of us all had a very quiet. Mm -hmm. Um, is there anything that you can remember um, that we haven't asked Gladys about those times? Gladys? Always. My father was the second president of the Holy Ghost Society. Um, and I grew up practically there all my life. I've been involved in What is life. the Holy Ghost Society? It's an organization. It's a Catholic organization uh, that um, they have the, the big feast of the Feast of Pentecost, which is the seventh Sunday after Easter. And they usually have um, a procession and mass. And then we have dinner up at the Holy Ghost. Have you ever been to the Holy Ghost Society? And they have dinner up at the Holy Ghost Society. But um, my father was the second president. And uh, then my uncle Manuel was a president. And my cousin John was a president. And then my husband was a president, and I was a president. We've all, it's been something like a fan, family thing that we've all become presidents of this society. In this society, we have about 900 um, members. And it's... Is it a social society? It's a religious, yeah, it's social and it's religious, you know. So we have the crowning of the children. Um, uh, when we have uh, we have the Holy Ghost, we bring the Holy Ghost, and the, the Holy Ghost, I'll bring you, or I will give you uh, the whole story on the Holy Ghost I have, and somebody rolls it up for me. It's, uh, uh, the Holy Ghost is on a, a silver crown, which is, you've seen it there, and I believe the story is in that, uh, that book. Yeah, the do, story. Do most of the persons in the Portuguese community know? All the ones that are Catholic. Most of the ones that are Catholic, not all, because mm -hmm. some don't want to pay the fifteen dollars uh, a year tuition. But the Holy Ghost is the crown. It's a symbol of the crown of Queen Saint Elizabeth, and the Holy Ghost is the dove that's at the top of the crown. And then if um, they, uh, we try out, we put in your name. If you want to become, uh, have the Holy Ghost in your house, they uh, set up an altar, and. Um, and then they uh, have the rosary every night. They say the rosary every night. They pick it up on Sunday, and you say the rosary all that week until the following week. And then you take it to church, and and we go in procession. In. You've seen it before, haven't you ever seen it? We go into procession into church, and then if you have some child that is not well, or, or you just made a promise, you have that child crowned on the altar with the... Holy, which is the crown of the Holy Ghost 
they, the priest puts it on his head and sprinkles you with the holy water and so forth. Um, you seem to now, at this time in your life, be very active um, in helping others and in, in helping the community. Um, and it seems to be a very natural part of your personality. Were you always like oh, that? Yes. Did you learn that from your mother? From my mother. Father? My mother. Yes, my mother, yes. My mother and father, but my mother. Mother. So your mother was in the volunteer mode? Yeah, always. And my mother would, years ago, would always be sending parcels of clothing and so forth back to Portugal. Is that still happening? That still happens to a lot of people. They always send clothes that doesn't fit and clothes are good. That's the same as we have down at Maps right now. I have clothes down there that's perfectly, you know, there's nothing wrong with them, but people either gain weight or they get tired of wearing the same thing and they bring it to us before I came here today. That's what I did. I had someone come in with a car load full of clothes and we have an empty room upstairs at Maps. We put it in there and when people come in, there are an awful lot of immigrants coming in from Brazil, an awful lot of immigrants coming in with the nothing but the clothes on their back. Because I believe the famine and the, the, um, the situation in Brazil is terrible. Mm -hmm. The bread lines, there was no work or anything. They were all fleeing to this country. You didn't know that. Oh, well, I knew that a big problem had happened with the government. Yeah, um, terrible. And, uh, and I knew that persons that have a lot of money now don't have a lot of money. Yeah. And so, uh, the other girl took a car load over to somebody's house up on Stackpole Street. Before I came home today, I took, I, right now I still have a sewing machine in my car to get some. So one of the things that, that you would sort of like to say um, is that, that, is that the community, um, you have a community of immigrants that need help. Not of our people. Our people are pretty well. It's uh, Portuguese, they speak Portuguese, but they're Brazilians. They're not coming in from our country. They're not coming in from Portugal? No, they're not. Um, let me ask you, how, how would you compare the new immigration to the old immigration? You mean how? Uh, because you're both, you both came to the United States, both communities came to the United States um, out of poverty, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, but you, your, your folks came to open arms of relatives and helpers and there was a job for them. Uh, I don't recall anyone's having said that they came with the clothes on their back. They just, they, but I hear that being said all the time now. Now, is now yes. Is, is there a different type of person that's an immigrant now? Except that they come from another country. They could just come from another country, but, and I think their poverty is worse than ours. You know, I think right now their poverty is terrible because at least when my family came in and our families came in, they came to someone that was already settled. These people are coming in. They have no one here at all, absolutely no relatives at all. I don't know what, I, I wouldn't have the courage to do what they have. They're coming into this country. They uh, rent a house and they have four and five people living in one house. They have no beds. They have absolutely nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, nothing. Um, They're sleeping on floors. It's been happening for such a long time now. Does, does, does the first, does the early Portuguese community reach out to this new Portuguese community in terms of uh, helping? Well, we try. See, some of these Portuguese community don't know this is existing. I happen to know because I work for MAP. You know, I happen to know because uh, someone has told these people MAPS is there to help them out and this is what we do. So when I know of anybody that has a bed or a, uh, we haven't got the place, the space to put all of this stuff in. But if like today it came, she put the stuff in her car and took it to someone, I put the other stuff in my car, I've already taken it to the a woman that's like eight months along. She doesn't even have a bed to sleep on yet. She's sleeping on the floor, and she's going to be expecting a baby pretty soon. So I happen to take a lot of baby things that was given to me, a high chair today, I took over to her, another carriage and, and food and so forth to her.
So they're not expected to have sponsors like you did no, when no. you came out? No, because every country is a different rule. See, I think Brazil, they can come in. See, with us, we wouldn't come. I don't think we have the courage that these people have. People have a lot of courage to come to a strange country and to, to meet with all of this problem. I, I couldn't do it. But there are, but, but when you folks came, I don't know, I mean, when your people came, I'm not sure that um, that they had anyone to speak to. At least these these Brazilians have That's someone right. who can speak to. But them. you see, but when they came, our folks came, they had the mills that they could all work, and they were young and they could work. And these people, yeah, most of them are coming in, they're only coming in as visitors, supposedly, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard for them to get a job. They can't get a job. Mm -hmm. The green card problem. Well, do you have um, some advice for for the uh, descendants of the early immigrants? Something that you would like them to know that you've learned over these years. I mean, I don't know what kind of advice I could give them, you know. What would you think I could give them, such as what? Well, what I've recognized um, in all of the folks that I've interviewed is a certain sturdiness, a certain um, health, uh, uh, a mental health, actually, an attitude um, of invulnerability that you're not really, nor have you ever asked anybody to help you with anything. It, it seems to be that while it is a very close and, and caring community, each person has really worked very hard for okay. himself. Yeah, for what they have. They have. They've worked very hard for what they have. Mm -hmm. okay. Well... <coughs> That was good, Gladys. I was married to Irish and Armenian, and I was married to a Portuguese. Now, see, that was the same case with Wilhelmina's family, too. They all didn't stay within the Portuguese. Yeah, we but are. how did you meet these folks if you, um, if your social life was primarily in the Portuguese community? Well, mine being the oldest and always the first, there's a lot more stricter rules when you're the first, you know? But when it comes to my sisters, everything had changed because we had grown up and so forth. And my mother was a lot more lenient with them because my sister, as I said, she started to work at the Grafton State Hospital and then from there nursing and then from there she went on to the service. But this is years later, you know, yeah. and my mother was no longer strict with them as she was with me. I was the first one. And she How was. many years are between you? There's only two years. Mm. But, you know, uh, it's different. Two years means a lot, you know. What what nationality did your brother marry? My brother married. Uh, she was Portuguese, but they didn't speak Portuguese at all. And my sister, the youngest one, is married. He his mother was Irish, and the father was Armenian. And my sister here, her husband was Lithuanian. So they didn't mingle with the Portuguese people at all because they married someone else, you know, of the other nationality, so very seldom do they, may, uh, you know, mingle. Me, I married a Portuguese fellow, and so I always mingled in with the Portuguese people. So the Portuguese community is pretty much people marry, uh, is Portuguese marrying Portuguese and staying within the community? Mo most of them, yes. And I but w when they marry out, it's hard because they have their own, he has his own friends and she has her own friends and their own nationality. How did your parents feel about that? Did that matter to them? No, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. Did religion matter? Yes, it does. In my house it did. My mother was a very strong religious person. Uh, I think you did, that you're right. That, uh, yes, my brother did that. That was his joy. And, uh, I mean, when people say, oh, you know, America, it wasn't always this way. So, 
in Europe they had a lot of difficulty. When I went over in 62, they had difficulties over there. But we had those when I was growing up, right. okay? And uh, Friday night, my mother would shut off the cold, you know, and let it cool off for Saturday morning. She wouldn't put too much coal in at night so that Saturday morning the fire would be out. And we had to polish, put the black shoe polish on the stove. And my mother's stove would shine, I'm telling you, like a mirror. It was gorgeous. But that was done once a week, you know. And we had cholas like that. But these people, you know, when they start to talk, they forget. I don't forget. My mother, twice a week, my mother would take up the big galvanized tubs, artificial tubs, you know, take them up and we'd take a bath, you know, put them in one of the rooms, heat the water on the stove, put them in the room and take a bath. That's what I used. Later on, then we had bathrooms. Where, where would you get the water? Out of the faucet? Yeah, the faucet. We put in these big kettles that you made soup and so forth, and put two or three pots on the stove, heating up, and then put it in the tub to take a bath. That's the way it was. I mean, it wasn't so. And then how did you empty that water? Must My be... mother had to scoop it out into the toilet, because yeah. we had a toilet naturally. Scoop it out into the toilet or the sink, and then put the tub away. Yeah. Well, but this is the way it was. And, um, and how about heating the water uh, when you had a gas? Uh, do you remember when you turned to, changed to a gas stack and got a water heater so that you had to heat? The gas stack. No, uh, and wait they, for the water to heat before you could run it. No, when they changed to water, I can remember my uncle putting in these uh, things in the um, closet there to heat the water up when they instilled the gas in that, and that was automatic. Mm -hmm. oh. That was. Automatic. You never had to light that. And wait. No, 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 we didn't. Oh. That was automatic. It had a pilot. I can remember it had a pilot, and you press the button and it would heat up itself. So. That was an amazing change. Oh, yeah. There was a lot of changes. What was the thing? What was the change that you liked the best, Gladys? Oh, I love that new bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> and now I have to have the that stove. Well, my mother got rid of that, and I can remember it was cream color. She bought a beautiful cream color stove, and this half of it was oh, it was huge. Half of it was a heating, like a full furnace for the for the heating with a no longer coal. We didn't have to lug the coal upstairs. It was oil, you know. But we had to uh, lug the big tanks, uh, gallons of uh, the bottles, like the water bottles that you have. You have to lug those up from the cellar oh. to to bring up and put in the the back of the stove. And the other side was gas. Oh, that was great. Wow. But I was tiny, but I remember these things, you know. Yeah. How many changes in 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 the system? Might oh. you have had before you left them. Oh, it was coal, and then it was oil, and then it was gas, and we got rid of the oil, and then it was gas. It was connected to the gas. It was a gas log that was put in the stove. And then automatically that went away, and then it was heat until it heated. <laughs> uh, so there's been a lot of changes. Some really great changes, though. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. And that's what's so wonderful about your generation. You can remember everything. Yeah. And you appreciate everything. Yeah, and that's uh, true. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember the um, the uh, coal man coming. They had these sleeves like, and they'd empty the thing down. And it, we had coal bins in the cellar, and I put the coal remember. down in there. And oh God, who, who got to shovel the coal into the furnace? It was in the stove. It was in didn't the furnace. A, a, we didn't a have furnace, We didn't have those. Furnace? No, no, this was coal oh, stoves in the house, yeah. in the kitchen. No, 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 no such a thing as... But that came later. That a, came a later. Pass. That The stoves was in, the coal was in the... It come up in these buckets, you know. It come in to the kitchen. And that was the only way we had heat was the coal stove. That was it. From the coal stove, we went to the... The oil. oil. From the oil, we had to light that up from the cellar, too. Oil. And from the oil, we went to gas. But then that was connected centrally. That was great. We didn't have to, no more like Then we moved out of there, and we went over to uh, uh, Chapel Street. Then we had the coal, the coal bin, no, no, over Chapel Street. We had the automatic. We had the central heating. 
That was great. Ah, okay. <laughs> now, what number chapel street is it? 101 chapel. 101. Yeah, 101 chapel. Yeah. We went from 44 Allen Street to 101 chapel. Do you remember any tragedies from the type of heating system? In other words, do you remember fires or anything? No, I don't. I don't know. And for your holidays like Christmas, how did you light your tree? Do you remember that when you were young? If I can remember when we were young, very young, we had no tree. If we had a tree, there were no lights on it. The most important thing about Christmas was the manger. Okay. Today, they forget the manger. They have the, the tree. I can remember my mother having a little tree, and underneath the tree would be the manger. And years ago, uh, many people, they didn't have trees. They had just artificial trees. Like, uh, you'd take this whole end of this room here, and you'd make the whole manger. You'd put in the little houses, and you'd put in the... Uh, all of the little villages and and the uh, the animals and so forth. You and know, with that, I'm and trying to think of the paper that they use because they put boxes underneath it and mold everything, yeah. and it looked like hills and and everything. It was I can remember that. There was a house on North Street, and it was always pictured in the paper. And she would open it up so that anybody it was uh, you could go in to see. She, oh, he did a, it was a whole room. It was absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. It had all the villages in Bethlehem. Yeah. Oh, it was gorgeous. Yeah. But, uh, I know, they did do. But the, there weren't too many trees in those days. It was mostly the manger and I was Bethlehem. wondering if you had, if you had real candles, um, real no. flame lit candles. No, I don't like remember. They if they may have, but I don't mm -hmm. remember. Well, Gladys, you know what? I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to create a little poem. Mm -hmm.